Welcome to this episode of Beyond the Talk. Uh, these are talks that are an extension of the conversations, the really important conversations that we've had at Elevate this year. So they're all about making sure that we continue those really good discussions and we're answering those calls to action that we've made. My name's Carl Richards. I'm Head of Operations here at FutureFit and that's who we're doing these Beyond the Talks with today. We are looking at inclusivity. So this is all about how inclusivity and accessibility affects the fitness industry. And we've got a great couple of people with us today. So Ali, do you want to introduce yourself first? Hi, my name is Ali Jawad. I'm a four-time Paralympian and the co-founder of the Exercise app. Thank you. Ben? Uh, my name is Ben Sharman. I'm a remote tutor and assessor with FutureFit. I've been working in the PT industry for about 10 years now. Um, but yeah, I've been with FutureFit for the, for the last couple. And I'm Chris Ranbury, a former athlete um, of 17 years. Wonderful. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. Um, so as I say, we are really just looking at extending the talks that we had at, at Elevate. Um, there's some really good uh, talks there, some really good experience that we had on the panel. Um, myself and Ali were on that, along with um, Jane Mystery, uh, who's a nutrition coach and, P and PT, and also Rebecca Gibson from Sports Structures as well. Um, and they added a lot of value. Uh, we got quite a big audience in the end as well, didn't we, Ali? It was a, it's a really, really good talk. Um, you also had your interview with Mark Bagnell as well. How yeah. did you find that? Yeah, good. Um, it's weird kind of talking about my journey and um, hoping it relates to people. Yeah. I uh, just want to give us a bit of an overview of that journey again, Ali, just uh, for everyone watching today. Yeah. So um, I was obviously born as a double leg amputee um, and I came, uh, came over to the UK when I was six months old. Um, and obviously, sport has been a huge kind of... I think, yeah, a huge factor in my life. So at six years old, I dreamt of going to the Paralympic Games because I watched a man called Michael Johnson win his double gold uh, gold medals. A legend. Um, a legend. Um, but I knew that I couldn't run like him. Yeah. But I knew that from that day on, I just wanted to feel what he was feeling. So yeah, fast forward, what, 18 years? Um, competed at four Paralympic Games, managed to win a medal in Rio. Um, so I've had an incredible career. Brilliant, wonderful. Um, so we we chatted quite a lot um, during the panel talk around you know your experience from from an elite sport point of view. Um, Jane had talked to us a little bit about her experience just from from a fitness side. Chris, do you want to talk to us maybe a little bit about your experience in in kind of the fitness world and so um, where you started? I'm, I'm a <laughs> complete polar opposite to Ali. Um, I was born with spine bifida and. Um, my dad always wanted, he was very much, you will not sit around watching TV, you will do something with yep. your life, etc. And I never wanted to do sport. I, I hated it. And I, I suppose I've always had this love-hate yeah. relationship with sport. You know, my dad, he drove me kicking and screaming to <laughs> local audio basketball club. Um, and I didn't particularly like it. It wasn't very yeah. good. Then wheelchair racing, um, had my first race at Stone Mandeville um, against a certain David Weir. Oh, and it was eight okay. laps of Stone Mandeville track and David was so fast he passed me eight times <laughs> before I finished my first lap. <laughs> so that really wasn't, you know, and, the, and then I found powerlifting actually okay. at, the, at the National Junior Games, um, which were organised by Will Power. And um, I found the powerlifting and I thought it was a really good, sport yeah. i perhaps got into it for the wrong reasons okay. in that i thought i could eat a lot more than i actually did <laughs> yeah. um, we've just spoken about food actually yeah, yeah. So. Oh. Um, and and also it so i'd been to atlanta to watch the paralympics that year and i'd seen the power lifting on the tv mm -hmm. and i was actually doing some bench pressing in the gym yeah. and Long story short, I'd got pounds and kilos mixed up. So okay. I thought I was as strong as the guy on the TV. Um, get home, find out I wasn't as yeah. strong. But it was the, um, it was something I realized actually I want to do. I'd always wanted to travel the world. And that was the- That was the drive. That was the drive. Um, I always vowed that I would do one Paralympics and that was it. Mm. Because my dad always wanted yeah. me to go to Paralympics. I never did a Paralympics, mm. but in a strange way, I'm glad that I never did because okay. I kept on trying, Yeah, you know, um, and I had the uh, pleasure or unfortunate pleasure 
of being beat by Ali in his first competition. Um, <laughs> and was that, that was here, wasn't that it? That was here, yeah, on. yeah. Which um, he never lets me forget. <laughs> um, but I, I'm glad I've had that journey. Yep. Um, because when I did retire, and I don't know if Ali's had the same thing, um, but actually when I retired, I, I missed it. Mm. You know? Yeah. Um, but I now, I, I enjoy fitness, yeah. but I don't particularly enjoy sport. Yeah. So the like, competitive uh, side. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I enjoy the competitive, but I'm a terrible trainer. Okay. I really am a terrible <laughs> trainer. Um, we'd have training camps and Ali would take an hour or so to do. Just warm up. Yeah. Just warm up. <laughs> Chris finished in 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm finished in 20 minutes. I need to get, yeah, get back yeah. and more look at me. I'm yeah. <laughs> um, but like, when I gave up the powerlifting and things and after a lot of the, I started taking up pushing okay. in, in my chair. And mm -hmm. so I've done London Marathon, done half marathons. Right. I, Ali did Milk Into Marathon. Yeah. Um, which was the most horrendous <laughs> experience, I think, for the pair of us. Yeah. Still traumatised. Yeah. <laughs> Completed um, it, though, right? Yeah, in good yeah. times. But, but I enjoyed the fitness rather than okay. perhaps... I enjoyed the fitness for trying to keep fit for myself. Yeah. But actually training for something I've always struggled with. Yeah. Okay. Um, ben, from your point of view, you're into your fitness, aren't mm -hmm. you? Do you have that same struggle with getting out there, doing things? 100%. Or? 100%. Yeah. I'm, I'm a lot more like you, Chris. I'm, I struggle with my maintenance. I struggle with my motivation all the time. Um, and I've always been the same, you know, I'd, I'd have it in my head that I, I wanted to do certain things and I'd go in it wholeheartedly, but then I didn't really have someone sort of backing me up and telling me, you know, do this, do that. I was sort of learning on my own. So I've definitely had very, very similar sort of experiences in yeah. relation to sticking to plans and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, from your point of view, did you feel like that support was there that you could go and speak to someone to, to help you with that motivation, to help you with your training plans? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think... When I first started my fitness journey, I worked in the prison service for, for about 10 years mm -hmm. and I was quite young when I started. I was very small, um, so I was quite intimidated by a lot of the people that I was working with, but I had a lot of colleagues there that would sort of like, I, I could go to and ask for support. Yeah. Uh, and through the prison service, that's when I got all my qualifications and things like that. Okay. I started working with people that were from a lot of different backgrounds and yeah. different ability levels and things like that. There were people with certain disabilities in, in the prison service that we I'd say we worked with, I think there is that stipulation in the fitness. I think we were briefly touching upon it before, weren't we? Where if you don't know, there's not a lot of education there, mm. is there? So if you don't know, you're sort of like keeping my arm's length. Yeah. I can't deal with you. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, but after that, going to education, I started to learn a little bit more about it and you yeah. know, start to get a bit more that's, understanding. I suppose that's it, isn't it? You, know, you, you guys have worked kind of sport-wise, elite sport-wise, whereas you know, Chris, from a, from a fitness point of view, where where do you think that that sits, you know, for someone like yourself in a wheelchair? Yeah. Do you think that the, an instructor would come up to you and, and say, do you need some help? Or do you, would you have confidence being able to do that with someone? I, I It's a very difficult thing when it comes to, to PTs mm -hmm. because being an athlete for so long, you, you gain a lot, of, a lot of knowledge. Yeah. So you know what's... What really? What's right for you? You know, yeah. like the handbook of PT, from what I understand, says on a bench press, don't touch your chest. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> we, and I thought Ali did say, we yeah. end up screaming at other people, oh, touch your chest. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think the, and it's not just the PT industry, but it's, I think, around the whole disability um community of weight loss okay that's i think that's the biggest thing so before lockdown or sorry during lockdown i'd gone up to about 17 stone okay and to be honest if it wasn't for ali saying because i'd always been told i had to lose weight mm. but never been told how okay you yeah. know he went here's how you do it blah 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 yeah and i lost four stone um and there's not that knowledge f for disability mm. um, within the fitness industry because 
they say, oh, have have this many calories. Yeah. Like, oh, I was told to have like two and a half thousand calories to lose weight. Well, if I have two thousand, I'm going to put a lot mm. of weight on. Yeah. And no, for the same because our metabolism isn't as yeah. quick, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's harder to burn calories. Yeah. Is it's, it in a world yeah, it's, it, it's, not, it's not just about those physical activity no. levels, is it? You know, like you say, that, that metabolism is, is different in all of us anyway, naturally. But with an impairment, you know, particularly when you're in a wheelchair, I would imagine that that's going to be a lot lower um, because your, your body's just not, not working in that way, is it? So, yeah, I think I'm very lucky with the, I guess you'd call me like a privileged disabled person. Mm. Competing at the highest level, you get access to a team that is world class yeah. and you get to learn not only about training and um, training programs but also nutrition at the mm. highest level sports science yeah. biomechanics um, kind of the biology of the body and how it works so we get access to testing that nobody else gets yeah. so what you do is you get to understand how different disabilities function with different calorie intakes yeah. um, I'm like well imagine that knowledge at like in the like disabled community, like that is huge knowledge mm. that is not being filtered down. Um, and that's what the problem is, right? It's just a lack of knowledge yeah. or the lack of resource to get access to them sort of practitioners. Yeah. And that's where I guess many people can't really relate to me because I've had that, I guess, privilege of being around some incredible people. Yeah. And I, I suppose you know, we've talked about the stats a hell of a lot. Um, 22% of the population in the UK someone living with a disability so how how do we provide that kind of service maybe not at that that elite level but that awareness that understanding to that population how how do we start to even approach that i, I actually think it's quite simple okay um i know there's been kind of hesitation especially from the pt industry um to actually involve disabled people because of the lack of knowledge mm. but i think for me it's um I guess the fitness industry at the moment is all about training programs and it being individual. And if you look at it, the training programs are, programs are not individual. They're mm. very generic. Yep. And with the disability community, that is very dangerous because every disability is different. And even the same disability, you've got a spectrum, yep. right? So you can't give out training programs. And there isn't a world leading expert on exercise prescription for every single disability. Mm. So what you do is, you give the disabled community um, knowledge yep. and then let them try and kind of experiment on themselves yeah. because one, they are the expert on their disability, I think, because mm -hmm. they have to live with it every single course, day. Yeah. Two, if they can try on error, eventually they'll understand what they're capable of and also they can actually progress and regress how they see fit. Yep. But three, they can also communicate with any support network around them how they want things done. Okay which also breaks a barrier of, I'm actually scared to even go up to the cell person just think it's get it wrong. Mm. So I think a cell person needs to be able to understand what they need before a PT comes along and actually you know, works with them. Because yeah. I think for me, it's a two-way conversation. Yeah. And that's where the, the barriers are. But I think, yeah, for me, it's all about get as much education there as possible yeah. and let them um, kind of trial and error, really. Yeah, give everyone that understanding, that empowerment, that, that awareness. But uh, I think also from the nutrition point of view, that I think that starts at NHS level. Mm. So say you've got a, a young child with a disability, they should be giving the parents advice yeah. on, you know, because let's be honest, a lot of children eat a lot of e-numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's great if they're running around, et cetera. Yeah. But a disabled child is not... Mm. active so i think it actually needs to start from the nhs and there is a there is a sadly a lack of knowledge uh within the nhs the the amount of times i personally have been in hospital they've sent a dietitian around to see me because they go oh, you're a big lad send a dietitian <laughs> yeah. i tell them what i'm eating and i'm honest you know i like the yeah. odd junk food yeah um you know really honest and they go well actually that's not too bad yeah it clearly is because I'm getting fatter. Yeah. So it's you. It goes back to that calorie intake. You know, just because 
um, the book says 2,500 calories yeah. for a, a male or, mm. or 2,000 calories for a female. Yeah. It has to be individual to to that person because yeah. everyone is different. Yeah. And like, yes, Ali probably could burn off 2,500 calories. I certainly couldn't. Mm. Um, so I think it actually has to start at NHS level. Mm. Um, and especially, you know, when people go from being able-bodied too disabled because that yeah. must be even harder in that they probably still carry on eating the same food yeah. that they were used to being in a certain way and yeah so it's that i think that needs education at an even further level yeah um which will hopefully then pass on mm. to the fitness industry yeah um i suppose we've, we've touched on that that <coughs> point a couple of times now and ben i suppose we we see that all the time where you know there there is that that PT handbook, you know, we we deliver qualifications to a specification, to a standard. What we try and aim to do is to take people beyond that standard in a way and, and allow them to actually see that these qualifications are here to make you safe and effective to a point, mm. but everything is individualized, isn't it? So um just within you know the qualification itself, Ben, you know, we've got uh, you know, we've got, got that standard, haven't we, where it talks about physical activity levels, you know, those um, just daily physical activity levels. But I suppose, what does physical activity mean to each of us? Mm. You know, for me, it's taking a walk around to the park, playing with the boys, whatever that might be. For someone else, it might be elite sport. But maybe are we, are we using the right terminology there? You know, when we say physical activity, what does that automatically say to you? You know, if I say, Ben, be more physically active, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think people have different ideas about what physical activity actually is. And I think yeah. people that don't aren't as active, they will see physical activity as being structured sessions, gym sessions, mm. exercise sessions. Whereas like you just said, you know, physical activity could just be activities of daily living, you know, yeah. like walking to the shops, taking your kids to the park, things yeah. like that. So it means something different to different people. Yeah, um, but I suppose we've got this this large population of people that, particularly within a, a fitness qualification, we're we maybe doing a bit of a disservice to, and we we need to look at that structure and say, well, what are these daily activities? You know, walking to the shop or taking kids around to the park, is that appropriate for this disabled community, or are we are we making it accessible? For them, just with the language that we're using. Yeah, so I had this conversation yesterday. Um, so I know people are obsessed with that, the 10,000 the 10, steps. Yeah, yeah. And they go to me, what's the water equivalent? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> the, water, the water equivalent. I was like, I actually don't know what the water yeah. equivalent is. I can't actually tell you. No. So I think, personally, I think we should, I think loads of studies should go into maybe using tracker watches yeah. to try and get an equivalent. Just mm -hmm. a ball line figure. Yeah. So one, you give people an idea of what they need to hit on a daily basis. Yeah. Or, you know, you know, to help people to start going out and pushing anyway. Because mm. I think that's, it's going to be good for them anyway. Yeah. So just go out and push and see where you get to and what feels good on a daily basis and what you can keep up with. Yeah. But yeah, the conversation yesterday was very interesting. Like, I actually don't know the, word, the equivalent of 10,000 steps off in a wheelchair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something that we yeah, that'd absolutely. be very I interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I uh, when when I've done like half marathons in my chair, I think that only works out at like four thousand pushes. Right. Okay. Wow. Really. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's like um, I think what we, we did we did the marathon, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I burnt like only eight hundred calories. Yeah. For the whole marathon. Oh, yeah. Wow. Nothing. Um, nothing. Okay. Yeah. And I I did just over a thousand. Yeah, twelve hundred odd. Yeah. You know, and now whether that's really good in that it takes in to consideration your weight, height, etc., or it's just mm. you know whether it actually takes into consideration the work rate because yeah. mm. obviously Ali is burning a f energy more efficient mm. than than I was because I'm not using yeah. more calories. It's yeah, it's hard to know. It's very interesting. And, yeah, the Apple Watch is interesting. And also, a lot of these tech companies, 
the only one I've found that actually do the wheelchair um, stuff is Apple. Okay. Stuff people like Fitbit mm. and Samsung don't, which it's, you would think it'd yeah. be everywhere. Yeah. It's that systemic approach, isn't it? I suppose mm. so. We're, you know, it's, it's really difficult to, to, for us to, to have that conversation and to say, oh, we should be doing this when there is that lack of understanding, that lack of knowledge there. If, know what we're deeming as the experts don't know and they're asking you guys. I think the wearables are interesting because there's a huge market at the moment. The wearables are not designed for disability. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a brand that comes along and goes, right, we are going to, you know, create a wearable that is going to be as impairment specific as it possibly can be. Yeah. So we can get as much data as possible to try and actually find out what 10,000 steps is equivalent in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I think the companies at the moment are not focusing on that they're mm. focusing on the masses yeah. rather than the biggest minority in the country yeah when i think there's a huge market there yeah. i think the old people would welcome a tracker for them yeah because they want they yeah. want them yeah but i think the, the mainstream trackers i just don't think they're they're just there yet yeah people in wheelchairs it, it, it'd make it a more inclusive world for me you know it'd make people want to actually be more active yeah. whatever that means mm. to them um i suppose what you know, you guys are doing at the moment is is looking at those specific impairments, isn't it? And Ali, you know, you've got exercise, Chris. I know that you're involved in that as well. So, um, yeah. just just talk to us about exercise briefly, Ali, and, and what what it is that you're trying to achieve with that. Yeah. So to give people some context behind it, because I think that's always important. Um, obviously, I've grown up in gyms and all my career. Um, but I always found that I was kind of the only disabled person in the gym. Mm. And I didn't actually realize why. I kept asking myself, like, why am I here and nobody else here sort of thing? Um, is it because I wanted to get to the games? So there's more drive there? Or were there barriers there that I just didn't know about, right? Um, so during lockdown, um, I knew that Tokyo was going to be my last games. So you have more time on your hands. I thought, well, that hasn't changed in 18 years. I mean, disabled people still haven't integrated into gyms. Um, and I know they want to get fit and active, but they are struggling for any sort of solution to help. And the knowledge isn't there. So um, I thought to myself, well, fitness apps are everywhere. There must be one for disability. So I got curious. There must be one. If there is one, I just want to look at it and see if it's any good. Yeah. Um, so I did my research and I found out there were about 71,000 fitness apps on the market. So huge amounts, right? So non-disabled people have so much choice but none catered especially for disabled people. And I thought to myself, it's either I'm not looking in the right places or it actually doesn't exist. So I got quite annoyed and I thought to myself, well, can I use my background in elite sport mm. and the learnings to create a fitness app that can cater for a lot of disabled people? But also how do you do it? How do you empower disabled people to exercise independently? So I thought to myself, okay, fitness apps are mainly on programming and you know engagement and community, which is great because it works. But for disability, we have to change the structure. It can't be programming because the users are the expert and I'm not. Yeah. I've got one disability, but I'm not. You know, I, I struggle for accessibility because I I don't know every single impairment, right? And I thought to myself, okay, how can we change the model up? So I thought if we just gave gave them information through um, a video library of exercises, but the exercise is performed by somebody of their disability, all they have to do is pick whatever exercise they want to do, and then they can create their own training, training, uh, training session from that. Yeah. And that's how you make them kind of independent. Mm -hmm. Rather than giving them training programs, they're in full control. Mm. So I started listing down some ideas, um, and we came up with like three big features into the app. So the other two are, a social hub, so it's a community within the app um, to obviously, you know, support each other and engage. The third feature is probably my favorite one. It's um, the explore section. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where the gyms come into play. Yep. I thought to myself, well, I, the ultimate aim is to get to sell people into gyms, right? But I know that gyms are not accessible. So I thought, what about we have an explore section that allows users to rate the accessibility of any gym mm -hmm. or sporting facility in the local area? That way they can understand where is the most accessible for them. Yeah. But also because it's public, uh, the gyms can understand 
just how inaccessible they are, I yeah. guess. Um, which is bad. Obviously, it's not bad. I'm not trying to criticize people. It's a learning tool for the gyms. Yeah. And that's what it is. Um, yeah. And for me, like, we felt with the three features that we've got into the app, it makes it the most complete solution that's out there right now. Yeah. And obviously, we've got a long way to go. Um, mm. You know, we've got, we started with like six, um, I think, three disabilities. Mm-hmm. And then we've got six now. And we're obviously growing every year. And obviously, we want to get it to, you know, as many disabilities as possible. Yeah. But to get an impairment into an, into the app like this takes months of hard yeah. work to get in mm-hmm. because of just, it's so niche yeah. and it has to be unique and it has to be safe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's been a huge learning for me. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. And I think, you know, what I particularly like, and it's something, Chris, that I think that, you know, we touched on earlier before, before we started filming was around facilities. And, you know, we spoke about, yeah, they can have a disabled parking bay. They can have the doors that open a little bit wider. They'll have a disabled toilet. But then when you get into the gym, what actually is there available? You know, when, when you go into a gym that's, you know, not perhaps geared up for it a little bit more like here is at Stoke Mandeville, what are some of the common issues that you find? I think, I mean, I'm very lucky in that I can transfer onto some equipment. Yeah. Um, however, there are some equipment that you again you need to help like the biggest one is lap pull downs hmm. you know because they're usually really high up yeah. and, and if there's no yeah. one about in the gym yeah um then you, you you can't do that um but i i think the biggest the biggest thing that's letting gyms down is that there are these brands of their equipment in hmm. the gym that we know there is an adaptable version of it for the same price Mm. where it just, you know, the seat just moves. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's about explaining to gyms that you don't need to have separate equipment. Yeah. It's just Just like some adjustable features. Adjustable features. Um, But again, the, the, I think the biggest thing and Ali and I differ, I guess a bit, on views on this is for me, weight loss I've always viewed is more cardio based mm. than, than weight based, uh, weight training based. The old age argument. Yeah. You know, mm. for me, it's, it's about <laughs> cardio. Mm-hmm. But again, there's no real, yes, there's things like the ski. Yeah. That's really good. But again, you need someone to reach it for you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and gyms don't have things like simple things like a hand bike, yeah. which again, anyone can use, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it's a great tool yeah. to have. And hopefully having the exercise app will encourage those gyms yeah. to go, you know, that that's yeah. your gym's not yeah. accessible. Yeah. Um, I think it would really help staff as well, like mm. people who are PT qualified within gyms to sort of open their eyes a little bit yeah. and see, okay, we maybe have this equipment now that's going to accommodate people with disabilities, but mm. they want to improve their knowledge yeah. on it as well. I mean, it, 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 it does put off disabled people going to the gyms mm. because why would you want to pay some of your income to go to a gym that you can't, use yeah and now we have things like these 24-hour gyms which are very reasonably priced but again no equipment yeah. to yeah. use uh, so yeah is is it has to change and hopefully the exercise yeah, I think, will I think change will raise that awareness well yeah. um and the more conversations that we can have you know with some of those chains um i don't know that we're going to do some work with them as well but it, it does, doesn't it? It filters all the way down from the manufacturers into the actual operators themselves and, and picking those options, doesn't it? Because it's it's allowing them to, to know that there is a big portion of the population. It's huge. Yeah. A huge portion of the population that want to be active, yeah. but don't feel like they they can do that in a what we would deem as a more safe and structured environment. Yeah. Um, and that's where we'd, we'd like to, to have people, isn't it? Because we can support them. Yes, maybe not with the programming because, like you say, you guys are experts a little bit like not any other client would be. Yeah, yeah. Is that they are the expert. They know what they want to do and they know what they prefer and what they don't. 
but at the same time, you, you do want to be able to support them in that way. So I think the the one thing about the app that we I didn't, didn't think of at first because we just focused on the user themselves was that the way we've structured the unique library was that because they are instructional videos mm. and they are impairment specific, you can lit like PTs, physios, rehab specialists, strength and conditioning coaches, they could literally access the library and yeah. go, I've got somebody coming into the gym, they've got you know, you know, a one leg amputee, I've literally got an app that'll create and build a, a session for me yeah. without even me going to a course. Mm. But I do get to learn on the spot. The user can also let them know what they like and not like. And if you've literally got it in your hand, yeah. that's never happened before. Mm. And that's where I think, you know, rather spending, you know, thousands of pounds on courses that are probably not great, mm. you've actually got something in your hand that does it in real time. Yeah. So I call it like real time CPD, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the, that's why it's so powerful because even though we focus on the user, what it does, it allows people around them to actually understand and learn as well. And yeah. I think that's where the app could be like the, I guess it could be like a um, the go-to when it yeah. comes to, you know, communication, I think. Yeah. And I think, it, it, you know, we, we again, we touched on this at the talk at Elevate. Um, it's There's almost a, a bit of a, a fear there, a conscious fear that, that some trainers will have in terms of, saying the wrong thing or offending somebody in a certain way you know and that can be with with any client but particularly for those that 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 have a, a, an impairment um you know and, and we spoke with jana didn't we and, and she said you know the biggest thing that she finds because jana is visually impaired she said you know people struggle to say see you later and they Same get really that. really funny about it and she's like she's just use normal language around me and i think mm -hmm. you know we, we probably don't do that enough we 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 treat pockets of population, yeah. not just the disability community, mm. but pockets of, commu of, of um, communities within within the UK where they're treated differently for, for whatever reason. And that's uh, when we talk about inclusivity and accessibility, we're, we're talking about it for everyone, aren't we, at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, the language should be, if someone's a wheelchair user, they're a wheelchair user. Don't yeah. be scared to say they're a wheelchair user. You know, a spade is a spade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just someone's blind, they're blind. Yeah. Someone's deaf, they're deaf. Yep. You know, um, just use use that terminology. It's it's only when you start using derogatory mm. yeah. terminology that yeah. it gets. Yeah, it's like any of us, isn't it? If it, if it offends <gasps> us, we're going to say, don't don't say that. Yeah. Or, or I prefer to be yeah. this. You know, Jane was very much prefers. I like to be called differently abled. I love, I've never heard that term until no, she said it. With, no. you know, I love that. Um, but it's very much about that conversation, isn't it? And it's, you know, we're doing some work with, with different organisations to try and increase that yeah. awareness just to, to improve the, the, the workforce in general. Because, you know, Ali, for you, I mean, how, how important is it that, you know, facilities like the, the one that we're in today and, and other facilities that inclusivity is on the top of the agenda on, for, for their workforce, you know, whether they are disabled or whether they are able-bodied? I think for me, um, the one thing that the fitness industry hasn't realized is how big the disability market is. Mm. It is huge. Like, as I said, it's the biggest minority in the country, probably yeah. in the world. And you're literally throwing money away by not servicing that community that yeah. actually have an appetite to get fair and active. Yeah. So one, how do you service them? Two, can you give them the same opportunity like everybody else? Because it's all about equal opportunity. Yeah. But also giving them a, a solution that gives them the opportunity in a safe environment for them to you know, pursue you know, their, their goals. Um, and that's where I've, I've always thought about like, how comes nobody's ever even attempted it? Mm. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I keep saying to Jim, you are missing out on, well, I think they, I think there's a stat of, I think they, they call it the purple pound, right? Yeah. For every like pound you invest in accessibility, you get nine pound back. That's a pretty good, I think that's, that's a, a pretty good return. Good return. <laughs> yeah. um, and think about like what, 20% of the population is disabled. Hmm. Just, um, just imagine, um, you know, how much disabled people can contribute to your company. Yeah. It's huge. Definitely. And people don't seem to see that. No. No, that's it. And I think, you know, with, with the education and the awareness side, again, at Elevate, we spoke about, you know, 
at the moment, a lot of that is a bit of a bolt on, but there is a need really, isn't there, to to drip feed that through through the education system. You know, talked about yeah. it from the top with the NHS and at that very start point. But mm. when we're talking about instructor education, you know, it's not just a case of right get to the end of your qualification and now here's something else to learn yeah, yeah. it kind of needs to be this is the pop these are the populations that you could possibly work with you know these are what you would do with this type of client that type of client it can just be that awareness piece couldn't it as, as we go through yeah so i did my pt qualification 12 13 years ago so on the form they didn't actually ask me if i had a disability so i showed up mm. to the assessment day and they were like oh uh, um, yeah. <laughs> you know the gym's downstairs like I, we don't even know how to assess you so I had to assess myself and pretty much pass myself which is bad <laughs> but it just shows you like it's not really changed since okay there are some CPD courses that you can take that's you know like specialised in like special populations yeah. but that's too generic for me mm. I think for me if you're going to truly understand different disabilities the course has to be impairment specific yeah. so how do you different amputees work? How do people with different spinal cord injuries work? How do people with MS work? I think there needs to be, um, I guess, a way where, yes, you get your PT qualification, but the CPD you do after that has to be very impairment specific if you want to work with that population. Yeah. And we're not talking about like, you know, high level education. We're mm -hmm. talking about a base. Yeah. And then they get some sort of appreciation and understanding. Yeah. So they can actually communicate with any sort of client that comes in, mm. rather than actually, you're disabled, I don't know what I'm doing. I actually really am sorry, I don't want to work with you. Yeah, um, yeah it's just. And that's the main thing you'll find yeah. with in most gyms. Yeah. That you just don't, they just they don't have that knowledge. Yeah. That communication isn't there for them to be able to say, oh, okay, you have this disability, I know what to do with that person, yeah. or at least I know where to go or get advice yeah. on it. And yeah. I think with your app, that'll be really helpful, not just for people with the mm. disabilities, but for, trainers as well, gym instructors, PTs, to be able to use it and say, right, okay, I can now see what needs to be done. And I think that'll be really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, again, you know, as part of the panel discussion, Rebecca brought up you know, how, how do we empower that workforce and how do we ensure that they've got the, the confidence and the awareness just you know, about themselves to be able to, to have those conversations and to be able to just understand the needs of, of of different people, whatever, you know, mm. walks through the door or, you know, I think walks through the door, uh, whatever that might be. I think a disabled person has to have confidence first That's to, the thing. Yeah, mm. going, That's going the thing. through the gym. And that, the way I think um, that's going to get better is by people working out at home um, because there's been this big boost of working out at home because yeah. of lockdown. And obviously, you can only reach to a certain point when you've worked out from home. So you then will have the drive to go that, hopefully have that drive to go further. And to do that, you, you need to join the gym. Um, so it's about giving those disabled people the confidence yeah. to know that they're going to a gym that People know what they're doing, the equipment's there. Mm. And if they want, you know, they don't have to be babysat to train. Um, yeah. And they can just go on and crack on with training. Yeah. Um, no, as, as part of the as part of the talk, we, we spoke about the call to action, didn't we? You know, and, and not just talking about it. And <laughs> yeah. what is it that we're doing beyond those talks, which is, you know, kind of what we're doing today and, and carrying on that conversation, but we don't want it to just continue being that conversation. So you know, we've definitely got the exercise app and, and you know, we're, we're here to support that mm -hmm. as, as here at Future Fit, you know, we are committed to, to accessibility, to inclusivity um, across our, not just our workforce, but within our courses mm -hmm. as well. So we are going to start to, to integrate some of the work, you know, Ali, that, that you've started and we're going to continue that um, as, as part of that with with yourself so um i suppose what what do we what else do we need to do moving forward what would be the big the big takeaways from from this summer and, and what do we want to see next year i think i think the big one for me is um getting the fitness industry on board with it like a lot of them say we want to be accessible i might like, prove it oh mm. well there's always an excuse 
Um, so I'll give you an example. We approached a very big gym chain uh, recently, and they admitted that all their personal trainers have no clue about disability. But they what they, they actually had a inclusive like um, officer making mm. sure that the company is it could be as inclusive as possible. And they go, oh, for your app, we could we could do that. Mm. Um, and they chose not to proceed. I was like, well, you literally employed somebody for that reason. Yeah. You've admitted that none of your workforce has got any education and you're simply going to walk away from it. Mm. They made it very hard for us. Yeah. So I think until you know, the gym chains come on board and actually act rather than project a message, um, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, uh, before Christmas, I cheekily emailed all the gyms I could think of, mm. big name gym, and I copied in a couple of newspapers into the email and said, you know, what? why don't you have mm. this, yeah. these facilities? Um, you know, it's not going to cost you more. Yeah. Why don't you have that? And only one gym replied. Um, and they said, you, you need to speak to your local branch manager. Okay. <laughs> but who will okay. then go and speak to head office? Head office. Yeah. So why so not someone just, else? That's yeah, exactly. yeah. Why not as head office just answer the question? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's it's not it's not difficult. No, um, and they just need to realise it's not difficult, and they can because as a disabled user, you want to get value for money. Yeah, and some of these gyms cost forty pounds a month. Mm. Now, if you're paying forty pounds a month, but you can only use say two bits of equipment, no that's not value for money. No, you want to be able to use. As yeah, much as you can, yeah. you know, be able to work up your whole, whole upper body yeah. or lower body, dep depends. Yeah. Um, but getting gyms on board is the most difficult thing. Um, and how we do that, I, I don't know. I think they see it as a criticism. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. they see it as an attack on them. <clears throat> I'm like, well, no, like use the explore section as feedback. Feedback. It's live yeah. feedback. You won't get access to that sort of community otherwise. And it's not like, you know, you're getting ripped to shreds. It's all just a, it's just a rating. It's feedback. And like you say, yeah. there's there's a market share there to be exactly. had. And, you know, we know that the world is driven by money. Yeah. Um, but it's just making sure that, you know, as well as knowing the commercial opportunity, it's understanding the ethical opportunity there as well. So, you know, I think that we could definitely push that forward. I mean, I, I know of one gym in my area that is accessible. However, their brand it costs about a hundred pounds a month yeah to to join their gym yeah. and i don't know I, I anyone that works um doesn't have that sort of money yeah. in mm. today's climate let alone a disabled person who, who may or may not yeah work as well yeah. um, i think another thing that i'd love to see within the industry is more disabled pts yes yeah. I, and i think that would also empower more disabled people to go to a gym yeah um and also having disabled pts pt not just disabled people but able-bodied yeah. people yeah. as well i think that would really change the industry yeah massively um and encourage and break down barriers yeah it is those barriers isn't it it's yeah. like about having those role models mm. but also having someone that they can resonate with as well at the same time okay well everyone thank you very much for your time today we hope you found this discussion really useful today we'd love to hear your feedback be sure to follow us on facebook instagram and give us a subscribe on youtube keep an eye out for details of our next beyond the talk session and we look forward to seeing you there